Good evening, councillors, and welcome to the meeting of the council this evening. I'm very pleased that my chaplain, Reverend Julian Elbra, is able to be here with us to do an opening prayer and then to lead for another meeting. In the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah says, Seek the welfare of the city where you live. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. We are grateful indeed that we live in a country where we can openly pray for our leaders. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said this, Pray for your monarchy, for all those in authority, so that we may learn to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Paul's message is as relevant now as it was when the church was first formed, so that your prayers can move mountains. So let us pray. God of all beauty, whose will it is that all people should enjoy the world and the life you have given us. Now we know that many are not able to do this because of hunger, poverty, addiction, disease, oppression, injustice, exploitation and neglect, or because of a lack of care by others. Lord, help us never to rest content until we have done everything in our power to help others less fortunate than ourselves. Now a prayer for you as local leaders. Jesus was born in a little town. He grew up under the authority of local leaders and officials who manage the majority of their daily lives. So we lift up today you as our local leaders. Especially today, we remember Pete Edwards and thank God for his incredible service and the example he set by his commitment and his passion, which has inspired so many of you to serve as councillors in this place. So we thank God for Pete's vision and the plans he had for Exeter. And we hold his family in our prayers and thoughts at this sad time. Lord, we pray for our Lord Mayor, for the City Council, County Commissioners, Police Chiefs, Judges, and all who serve our local communities. I pray that you will strengthen them with wisdom and grace for the heavy burdens they carry. May they manage their teams and projects with love, keep their hearts pure and their eyes turned towards your face as they work in the best interests of the people they are called to serve. Amen. Before we commence the business of the evening, may I just say that we have all been deeply saddened by the death of our former colleague, Pete Edwards, and I, the leader of, on behalf of the City Council, have expressed our sincere condolences to his family. It is appropriate that before we start the proceedings of the Council meeting, that we will be sitting down to watch a video, at the end of which we will stand to applaud the people one minute, after which tributes will be made to him. Please take your seats. my uh, last uh, staff do because I'm not standing next to me uh, so you can see what I've got uh, but I will miss it but then again I think uh, I've, I've done enough and uh, just like to see a new leader in the council and see where that person wants to take us uh, but no, I've enjoyed it I've enjoyed it. the main thing about it is about uh, the achievements what we've achieved as a city you know, then we can take that away from us. Uh, and that's 
or down to you. Uh, but, and, and I think it's something to do with the policies that have been put in. And of course, my friend here, one of the white three, who's uh, who made a lot of that possible, just he's, he's, he's very, very, very good at his job. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, I will miss it. Unless any of you next year will wait me on the side as you guess, like you know, I mean, I should try all okay. But uh, no, uh, I, I really would like to thank you all for everything you've done and, and continue to do on a daily basis uh, for on some heroes. It's a good opportunity actually for us to say um, thanks to you people and uh, actually pay tribute to what you've achieved. Your judgment has been fantastic, you've honored me as your achievement. Yeah? <laughs> Very good. You've been out of luck. I hope I've left uh, the uh, place a better place than when I first came here. I think I have personally, I have no regrets on any of the decisions I've made. It's still a lovely city, I'm born in Brady, uh, and it's a lovely place to live, work, drink, and do all sorts of things. And uh, it's a you know, long time to all you people. Um, thank you very much. The city's gone from strength. Tea. Tea. <laughs> the city's gone from strength to strength. I think the, the staff have always appreciated your, your candor and your sense of humor. You don't set the floors, but at the same time, you've got a generosity of spirit, mm -hmm. and we love the, the fun that you, you create and working for you. And uh, I think generally people enjoy coming to work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that says a lot. And, and one thing I'm really looking forward to is all this political crap. I don't have to watch what I say, I don't have to watch what I say for the uh, and all these things. Because I will be here. Watch out, sir. You can put that in, don't worry. Uh, but I mean, it's going to be fantastic because I'll just be as I was. And, uh, you know, I try to even speak sometimes. Hey, man, you shouldn't say that.
I know that Councillor Bialik, the leader, wishes to say a few words. Councillor Bialik. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I feel I need to stand up, you'll accept that. And it will be a few words. Sorry, everybody. But I think this is very important. I think that was a fantastic video and the pictures, I have to say, are continually coming in and I'm receiving them almost by the hour. And I'm sending them on to Robson to make sure that the family will receive them all. He has been a friend of mine since 1974. I want to talk a bit about the person. I first met him, uh, I was allocated to be his conductor uh, for a week. We used to have a different driver every week. It was a fantastic great week. Uh, we got up to a few things there and there. I think the disciplinary rules would allow it. I think they're all spent now after 48 years. I knew Pete then, I got to know him, and my friendship with him sort of matured thereafter. He approached me to come along to a union meeting, identifying me as somebody who's a bit noisy in the county, self-opinionated, and always had something to say about nearly every matter that was going on in the company. He introduced me to join the Labour Party that year, which I did. I uh, was an active member along with Peter. He encouraged me to stand. Don't worry, Andrew. He encouraged me to stand in Topsham in 1979. <coughs> Didn't quite do it. And Peter, uh, in eight, 19, I think it was 1984, Peter and myself uh, were two of 14 councillors that got elected to the city council in that time. During that period of time, Pete and I worked together within the trade union, representing bus drivers, conductors, engineering staff, clerical workers, and I like to think I learned a lot of how to talk to people, how to deal with their issues from Peter during that time, many initiatives. We rose up together, we were following one another effectively. I was the branch secretary, then he became the branch secretary. I served on our union's national executive, he served on the union's national executive. They then got me elected as a full-time official, basically getting me out of the way, really, of the local branch. He worked hard, day in, day out, to represent those workers within the bus company here in Exeter. He also got himself onto the council, as you can see. I think that was in 1982 uh, that he got elected. A couple of faces there we knew, the late Paul Oliver, Hilda Sturry, and one or two other people that we got elected in 1982. I suppose serving people in Exeter has been what Peter has done all his life and he has continued to do that to the end, in Pete's way, by the way. Uh, a few rough edges, he'll accept that, but you knew where you stood with Pete, and that missed, in my case, Jenny at the bar getting the next round. But apart from that, he did, he did offer up, I can assure you. We were good friends, as many other people in this room hopefully will say he was a friend of theirs as well. So, he's got a great family, terrific support, and it's been my privilege to have known Peter and to claim him as one of my friends and he as a friend of mine. We talked about a number of great things. Uh, I dabbled with a place in Spain for a while and I always remember it was about 2008, I think. Labour actually for about two years lost control of the city and I can remember you can imagine the sight of Peter and myself in a swimming pool drinking San Miguel, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But he would talk to me about these things, he was a great confident 
and we used to talk about a lot of things. He helped me through a couple of personal situations. I could always go to him with things I needed to talk to him about on a personal basis. He was always there and he would always tell me straight. I didn't like everything he had to tell me, by the way. But most, if not all, of those things were always correct at the end of it when I came back to analyse it. So he would been a great friend to me. Very loyal. He'll tell you what he thinks of you. He cared immensely for this city. He really did. His family were proud of him. Really proud of him. Secondary modern school boy. Social mobility. Making it through the various levels within the trade union. Highly respected. And one of the pictures in there, one of you might not have noticed, was the former general secretary of the RMT trade union, Mick Cash. That was his standing. That was his standing in the trade union movement and also within the Labour Party. Many of my friends will hopefully speak in a moment about his commitment to the Labour Party and to our cause. He, cer he certainly deserves the tributes and recognition tonight. And so, as the article in the Express and Echo said, he was a good socialist. He learned a lot and he used the trade union, actually gave him education as it did with me, to help him through his career in the trade union, the bus company, and also the Labour Party. Pete, sometimes as you saw, and I saw the bubble come out, Kareem, OMG, and Pete was like that. He wore his heart on his sleeve. He would say a lot. And he said to me, and he won't mind me saying this, quite recently, Phil, what's a misogynist? I said, Peter, you are not that. You are not a woman hater. You love your wife. You do so much. He spent so much time caring for Syl. Syl's been poorly. Whilst he was running the council, he was still caring and doing stuff at home. This is all sides a lot of us didn't appreciate that he was doing. The pressures of all of that. He'd done all that. He saw it through. Together with the family. It's been a privilege to have known Peter. I call him my friend. His family are great. I hope we are all there on the day of his funeral to support the family. I wish them well. And as I said quite recently, at a passing of a great friend of mine, and now Peter, the tears will pass and we will remember the good times and the pleasure of the experiences and the lessons that he brought to us. Lord Mayor, I must stop now. I could go on. There are many stories I will recount over the periods of time with you, many of you, and you with me. And we must continue to talk about him in that way. Good times, bad times, let's talk about Pete. Remember Pete. Let's not be embarrassed to mention his name. He was great for this city. You've seen it in the vision, and I just hope that I can, together with the rest of my team, hopefully just walk a little bit in the shadow of Peter over the coming years. He deserves it. And finally, Rendon, he was there to help open the bus station. I'm saddened that he will not be there on the opening of St. Sibyl's Point. That was the vision. That was the vision he gave us. He saw it through. When many others would have moved away from all of that a good time. I remember coming back in the car, hands free from Cornwall, Emma and Justin ringed me and said, Phil, we've got a problem. This is when the award came back and we couldn't get it. We're worried about what Pete is going to say. I said, well, look at me. You need to talk to Pete. And Pete was there. He didn't flinch. 
He didn't say, let's pack up. He said, let's go on. And we can all see St. Sibyl's Point coming out of the ground and will obviously be open as soon as we can get it there. I can assure you we will remember Pete. We will remember Pete at that uh, opening and he will be remembered for that St. Sibyl's Point. For how he actually intervened from the public sector to intervene to make sure that happened. And we'll be able to look at that year on year. And so, Lord Mayor, I will end there. I just wanted to say, I don't want to say no more. I can't say no more. But thank you, Peter. Thank you, Lord Mayor. If you let me uh, say a few words for you on behalf of the staff. And uh, that was a fine tribute, that video, because I think it reminded us of all the things that we've been doing, and sometimes we forget. But I think it's a message really to all of you politicians that, you know, there's, there's things about legacy. And you, you, you sit in the, the Guildhall building and you look at the names. And we all take pride in the legacy of the, the people that have been before and what they've achieved. And sometimes I think we. We, we probably don't talk enough about what you do in making history and, and leaving legacy here and now. If you don't, if, if I can, I just want to just say there's a few things about really the, the role of the leader and my relationship with Pete to illustrate what is done. And often when I talk to people, they are completely uh, unaware of the, the, the role of a, of a chief uh, of a leader of a council. And in fact, Pete's family were unaware of what he did. So if I can just illustrate the kind of things that he as leader of the council did for the city and the impact that he had, and I would I would start off by saying this. Very few things are done by a single person. Everything we achieve generally has got a lot of uh, people who are responsible for delivering. But one person can stop things. One person can put an end to it before it even starts. And I just want to illustrate some of the things. So I served as Pete, for Pete as both a director and as a chief executive. And when I was with him as a director, when he was the new leader of the council, one of the first things the council had to face up to was austerity. All the local government sector were going to be hit what, with austerity. And there would be various ways you could go about it, and Pete uh, understood from his point of view of what was the purpose of a council in supporting a strong city. And so his words to me was, we need to redesign the services that puts the residents or the customers, the citizens, customers we sometimes use, at the centre of the way we redesign services. And we need to start by stripping out the bureaucracy and start to save money that way, rather than impact on the residents. And as an example of that, he forced us to do some systems map mapping. What that meant in practice was mapping the experience of the residents who come in and are asking for services. And one, one particular lady in particular stuck out. She came in for some help with housing and benefits and she was dealt with 34 times before she actually got the answer she wanted. We mapped it. And every one of those stages the officers felt they were doing a good job and we had to tick because they came in and got an answer and it was done quickly. But they didn't get the right answer. And so what Peter said, rethink the way you design your services so they're not passed from pillar to post and that when they come in, whether it's a housing problem or a financial problem, I want the council to address it. What I'm saying that the role of a leader is the what. Is, is the what. I say to Pete, I can't do the what for you, Pete. That's your political decision. My job and our staff is to help you with the how. You need to tell us what you want. And so he was very clear. So a number of things throughout that period when he was the leader, I just want to just illustrate and so hopefully help with everybody's understanding of the role that he played in building a successful city. And there was an illustration of that with a photo with Andrew and with Pete down with the environmental, uh, the flood defense scheme, development agency. Austerity came, a different demand on capital program. 
government said 50% must come from you locally. We'll give 50% to the environment agency. My plan has said we need to meet the shortfall, 12 million. It was 25 million scheme, 12 and a half million. We would find it. He said, all our seal would just go on the flood defense scheme. I'll tell you what we'll do. You put three million on the pot and say to the county magic, and we'll leave the private sector find the other six. Well, when we put the three million in, county matching the three million, the government said, actually, now you've done now, we don't need you to find the rest, and the government picked up the tap. Most people will be unaware of that. My officer said, pick up the whole tap, still. His view was, that money had to go further. So that was, a, that was one example. Housing, 2011-12, collapsed. Connors, rock, went into bankruptcy. We built 90 houses in the city. Pete said, we've got to do something about it. Bring all the managing directors of all the house builders to get in the room, and let's ask them the question, what are we going to do to get in the bill? They said, you're forcing us to build houses that we can't sell. One, two bedrooms. The only people who can get a mortgage from the bank, remember the recession we had. The only people who get a mortgage from the bank were families with a job. We need to build three or four bedroom houses. Secondly, the affordable housing is so high we can't build, it doesn't stack up finally. We said, our policy is 35%. Pete said, that's okay. 35% of nothing is nothing. 25% of something is something. We'll allow them to do 25%. So we suspended the policy, we got house building moving. The house building started in the city. John Lewis came knocking. We wanted to land John Lewis. John Lewis said, we got doubts. What are the doubts? Two things. The car parking is inadequate, unacceptable, not the kind of standard we would assume. And secondly, there's a two-lane carriageway between John Lewis, where it would go, and High Street. We, 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 we got doubts about it. What would it take? If you could address those two things, we will come. I said to Pete, Pete is going to cost two and a half million. Remember that the, the county gave you a hospital pass about taking traffic out? really difficult challenge. He said we've got to find the money. Because at that time we had high levels of vacancies. John Lewis came, the high street, on our high street hasn't looked any better. I want to say this to you because you get knocked as politicians all the time because it's really easy to knock you. When you have to take a decision like we will find two and a half million when people were saying you couldn't borrow because there was no capital. Our city centre, I guarantee you, this city centre would not be in the condition it was if we didn't land John Lewis on that high street. I gave him literally an hour to make a decision because we had to get it in if we we're going to get that decision. He told me what, and in his own words, I put him in that position. He didn't like it, but he made that decision. Same thing, Rugby World Cup, phone call comes in from Tony Rowe. Bristol's pulled out in Rugby World Cup. Would we, would we host? He didn't hesitate, quarter million pound, he needed to get it done. The big weekend, BBC wanted to post the powder run. 200,000 pounds, we didn't have the money. Spoke to Teambridge, it's gonna be in that patch. Teambridge were nervous about it, Jeremy Christopher. He said, the right thing to do for our youngsters, we need to find the money. We worked with them, we delivered it. What a brilliant experience, I remember the day we won the Premiership, I think, if you remember rightly, and then we came up. That was one of the best weekends in my life. I'm telling you now. Rugby, you're tricking up, winning it, coming up, and then going to the big weekend. Our youngsters have loved it. The loved, 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 loved it. I was a politician. I couldn't do it as an officer. I won't give an illustration of that. I was always saying to Pete, if the money's the objective, you can't do it, Pete. His view was, sometimes you had to do it. I said, that's okay, that's your call. As an officer, I'm saying if you want to deliver a project, on time and budget, you do it. Those are the decisions as a leader of council he took, and you take us always as politicians, and the public are unaware of those kind of issues. So, sorry, Long, I just want to say, because this is, this is his legacy, and I want to just say this. We talk about the swimming pool and bus station. These projects took over 20 years. I remember Chester Long was leader of council wanting to move the bus layover area to allow us to redevelop that and how long that is taking. And what you're delivering there is a swimming pool passive house. That's down to 
him said it, Mrs. Pete said it. I want the experience for people going into that pool to be different from what's ever been before. That you are going into a pool where the experience is you don't get temperature changes because you're in the water, it's hot, and when you come out, you're freezing and you get chlorine in your eyes. I want a completely different experience. He went to Germany, he looked at it and said, I want you to feel that. That to me is what leaders do. That's what you have to do as politicians. Do what? Our officers, and I take pride in our officers, we've always tried to deliver what the council said they want to do in the best way you can. But I work very closely with people over a decade, and I can say to you, what I saw was a remarkable person who might have not been the most articulate person, but had a tremendous sense of judgment and could read the room in a fantastic way. He could say things that no one else could say because he had a glimmer in his eye and you didn't take offense. And the number of times he called me in my car, a useless driver, and I never took offense because the spirit that he gave it was well meaning. And I think. I'm going to stop there because I'd like to say some things in a personal capacity at another occasion. Thank you, Phil and Colleen, for your memories. Of course, many of you will have memories to share, and this is now your opportunity. Everybody who wants to speak will be given the opportunity. Please be patient. If you want to say something, if you raise your hands, with John's help, we will try and call you more or less in the order that you raised your hands. But everybody who wants to speak will now have that opportunity. Uh, Councillor Morse, please, and then Councillor Sutton. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I wasn't prepared to hear Pete's voice, so I'm a bit more shaky than I expected. It's a bit of a shock, so I'm sorry for this. I'm a bit wobbly. I have known Pete for as long as I can remember. He's always been there in a room, smoking a cigarette, or laughing with my dad, or sat in a car, or saying something daft, and you just took him for granted. I, uh, I called my brother to let him know that Pete had passed away, and he went, I always liked Pete, because he looked like a Mexican bandit, and he never looked like to lie too seriously. And he kind of did it, but he really did. And I don't know how someone encompasses that in such a beautiful way that you could have a laugh with Pete and you could be silly and you could get away with saying some terrible things. But he also could run the city council and leave a legacy as great as his. And I don't think he even noticed him done it. I think he left and went, oh, I have what I did. I don't think he knew what he did. And I think it's only now he's gone that we're all sitting down and people are going to talk about all his legacies. And there are swimming pools and John Lewis and Ikea and you know, seeing through those dreams that we've had since the early 80s, you know, and staying committed. And, you know, along the way, some people got scared, including my dad, because of recessions. And he still stuck with things and got them finished. So we, we owe a lot to him. He is a Star Wars and a legend and a true Exonian and the king of the inappropriate comment. But he, he believed in the city, he, he loved it. And the outpouring of grief we've seen, the Exeter City Football Club, thank you so very much for what you did on Saturday because it was a bit in tribute to him to hear all those people cheer when we, they said his name. Um, he was often accused of being caught in the past or of being misogynist, as Councillor Pryalic put it. And I have lost track, like, track of how many times I explained to him he couldn't refer to the female members of his cabinet as the girls, and that we were women and we should be respected as such. But he never meant that. Do you know, he, he promoted me when I'd barely been in the council for five minutes into a role he believed I could do. And he overlooked men and he looked over women that sat here a lot longer, and he believed in me. And I'm still here, so he must have got something right. You know, it kind of all been wrong. And he did that for other women. He did, Rosie Dunham was barely 22, I think, and newly elected, and she is without a doubt the person I aspire to be on this council. And he made that, he created her, and he had so much faith in her to create that person. He also promoted so many young people and put faith in them when people probably thought, oh, what do they know about this? You know, the Stephen Brimbles, the Dan Gotter Jorts, the Luke Sills of this world. He believed in them, and I think we overlook that when we remember the inappropriate comments that sometimes slipped out, that actually he couldn't have been less of a misogynist if he tried. I think he sometimes quite enjoyed the wind-up that went with it. 
I loved finding with Pete. It was like the best thing in the world. It's like having a row with my dad. You could really let rip and we'd shout. And I think sometimes officers would think that's not appropriate. But you know what? As I left that meeting and we walked outside, he turned around and said, do you need a lift down? And we'd chat about his wife or his dad or my kids. And it was over. That row was done. It was sport to a certain extent. And we'd have said our piece and we probably didn't agree. And I'm a loyal girl, so I did what I was told. But I wasn't the only loyal one. Pete was so loyal to this council, to his friends, to Phil, to my dad, to Corey, to all of us. He, his loyalty was unshakable, even when he knew we'd done something wrong, which is why sometimes when we didn't agree with him, we were fiercely loyal to him too. He had some sort of funny memories of him. Uh, I've got a great picture that I'll have to get to see with him when he rang in like he was throwing a Molotov cocktail at a community event. Or the way he used to buy things at, at fairs and fakes that he had no intention of using or keeping. My house was full of them because he'd give them to me as he left me. He wanted to support the local community event. He wanted to give to that charity. He never wanted to win the raffle, that's for sure. He loved his family fiercely and he as Phil said, Silk was not always well, and I had this big lolloping greyhound, and she loved it. And every time he came into my work and Juno was there, he'd take a photo so he could take her home to show Silk because it would make her smile. He drove his grandchildren everywhere, especially when they'd had a little too much to drink, and as they got older and learned to drive, he really enjoyed getting them to pick him up when he'd had a few too many. And driving, that was a whole other one day. The gall of him to ever go at Ukraine, watching him drive that bus used to terrify me. But that's not going to remember shouty, argue, funny, loyal Pete is in that fun bus driving into the sunshine, hitting a curb and probably crashing it slightly. We're going to miss you, Pete. You are a star. Before going on to call Councillor Rachel Sutter, I'm going to call Councillor Ledbetter to see if he would like to speak. Thank you very much. I'm going to say a few words, but Yolanda is going to, is going to speak on behalf of the Conservative. If Yolanda can speak up for you, and yeah, then Councillor Sutter. She, 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 she says an awful long time. Almost as long, almost as, long as her husband, she says. I've tried to find her this year before, I suppose, but she wrote so. So, um, Councillor Adler, I think that was a, that was a touching tribute you gave, and as, as was the picture, and uh, yeah, you, you spoke very well. It's quite clear that I, I didn't know as well as all you. Um, obviously we, we had our differences, but it is quite clear he did have vision. Um, the word that comes through long in, in, is that word service. Uh, he didn't just do service to this council, he gave service to his union, and, like, and I didn't realise he gave service to his family as well. I didn't realise he'd, he'd, he'd been caring for his wife. So that's what comes through. <coughs> Commitment, dedication, service. Uh, you mentioned he's a good socialist. But I think the thing that's come through with Kareem's point, touching things, he's actually made decisions. And it's all too well in today's. It's very easy not to make a decision. I know you, we sometimes disagree, and, but he obviously had the, 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 the thing of his conviction was the um, my brain's gone. But he, 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 he made decisions and he carried them through. So he, he was he really he really was a leader, and it's been good for his thing. I think one thing he, he's going to miss is that, that picture you showed. He had his opportunity to push it in the river, then, and, he, and he, he's not going to have it push me in his swimming pool. Okay, so he should. <laughs> Taking his opportunity when he had it. So, uh, my commiserations to top off with the family. Uh, he died too young, and that day, that probably happened. Uh, yeah. Good for his family. I'll hand over to you on because we'll say some more words. Thank you, Councillor Ledbetter. Thank you, Councillor Henson. Now, Councillor Ledbetter, you have the Pete and I go back an um, awful long way. And I, I say that not with any malice because we're on two different sides. But in fact, what annoyed me with Peter, very much so, that here he is at the end of his life and he's still black hair and I've lost my leg. And he held it. But it is quite true that that him and I think very much. Exeter is, it, it's our faith, if you would like to say. 
And I know very well that we were on different sides, and he didn't always agree. You were dead right, um, you know. But he would never hold it against you. Pete is clearly not known for his dirty dressing. <laughs> he, he, as we know, uh, you know, he can be uh, the shirt hanger. That's it, he's bloody shirt. Oh, all right, lady, sir. And he would go on, but clothes do not make the man. I would say that he had difficulty in times when he had an accident and I went into hospital to see him. And he was there and, and I, I laughed and he said, maybe what you're laughing at? He said, I shall have to take more water with it next time. That was the time he was but he was clearly in pain because he was up here with the, with the blown up balloons underneath and he just looked like Mitchell Man and that's what I called him, was Mitchell Man. But leadership, this is not the rite of passage to any one of us, but sometimes one just comes out of the pack now and again, and different times. It might be right for that particular time. Another leader will come, like that, and might continue on. But the, he had vision. The one thing that if we did argue, and you say you had your family arguments, he was always respectful, but do you, he would have a go at me about some things, and I'd have a go at him about some things. He would leave it there. He would leave it. You know, and I used to sometimes drop it home sometimes, so I was doing all the things. Never trip. But leadership comes of how you deal with the oppositions in our view in politics. It's also how you treat what the business sector is coming that you're going to meet. How would you treat the, the oppositions? He, I can only speak as I find, and I've always spoken as I find with him. But he, again, was extremely passionate. And I think, I do recognize what you said, Craig, on his behalf. If something is there that I didn't know, and I do thank you for for uh, enlightening us on that. But uh, there was difficult times when in, uh, in the uh, 20, in 2011, when the times were going to be difficult, and the decisions were difficult. Uh, did I agree with them all? Or did we agree on this side? No, we didn't. But we had our say. But time has moved on. It's been proved that Exeter is now uh, sort of not safe, no city is safe, but it is prosperous. What you saw in Pete when he stands in front of you is what you got, and that's what I respect of anyone, and that's all I would ask of anybody in the opposite side. God bless you. Thank you. Go back. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Sutter, could you speak to us now, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Like Councillor Moore, Sam, to Councillor Bialik, this is going to be a tough gig. I walked up Kingsway last week and Pete's bus was parked on the side of the road before the bus. And I thought of the lifts I'd had home with Lady Gaga coming out the radio. And he did bring a lump to my throat in the same way as that video brought a lump to my throat. 
And I completely agree with comments that have already been made, so I'm not going to repeat those. Um, but like Councillor Moores, I was one of the, the women who were encouraged by him to take on responsibility um, to stand as his deputy leader when Councillor Dillis Baldwin um, stood down. Um, he had confidence in me, he had faith in me, and I thank him for that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the like, more personal um, memories I have of him. Um, I'm going to start with St. Sigwell's point. There are people who are still in a very derogatory way, and people make derogatory comments uh, below the line in the Express and Echo. Frankly, Pete never knew because he never bothered to read them, um, and he was quite right. But there are people who talk about Pete's having pool, Pete's pool. And do you know what? I think calling it Pete's pool is actually a compliment. They don't intend it that way because Pete passionately believed that the people of Exeter deserved the best quality. He thought that the taxpayers of Exeter, who perhaps couldn't afford membership of one of the private health clubs with swimming pools, deserved to have a quality swimming pool that was of the same standard, if not better. And you know what? He's right. And we're going to enjoy using that pool, and the people of Exeter will enjoy using that pool, and the children of Exeter who learn to swim in that pool will enjoy it. And if people call it Pete's Pool, well, that's fine with me. And while we were still making the decision and making those plans, there was a research trip to Germany to look at passive house standard swimming pools. And I have to say, we worked jolly hard on that trip, but we played jolly hard as well. And I think I'm going to leave it there, because what happens on tour stays on tour. And finally, the bike shop also late and lamented in this city, the Bikeshed Theatre. Theatre wasn't Pete's natural environment. He went to the North Lot, he went to performances, but it wouldn't have been his first choice of an evening out, as Councillor Biardo for well known. But there was one occasion, I think it was the opening of one of the festivals of local theatre, and Pete and I had both been invited, and he, he said he would come along, and that was great. And we agreed this, and he went, write me some words, Rach. So I dutifully, a couple of pages of, of you know, neatly typed thoughts and things that I thought would be worth saying in the speech of the bike shed. We got down there. He probably skim read it. Certainly didn't read it. But he stood up and he made a speech and he had that bunch of mostly young theatre makers who probably didn't know him from the bar of soap, he had him in the palm of his hand. One of them said later, if that guy did a stand-up show, I'd pay to go and see it. <laughs> At one point, and I was telling Dave Lockwood about this the other day, at one point, he looked at me and he went, are we finding this, Rach? And I went, we are actually. He went, oh, okay then. But he loved this city, he loved everything about the city already been said, and I'm going to miss it terribly. Rest in peace. Thank you, Rachel. Councillor Hannaford, would you like to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think you know, we all know about Pete's service to this council and the vision. And up his vision and vision and she had all next to come up as less estimated. And I think a lot of that was driven by the fact that he passionately wanted future generations to have a better uh, start in life, to have decent, well paid jobs, somewhere safe and secure to live. And those were really at the core of his his view. I mean, I mean I remember the when I was on the executive had the big row about the maths academy and it wasn't exactly in line with Labour Party policy um, and he had a wonderful sort of turn of phrase which I won't repeat Lord Mayor here because I think it, um, you know we've got uh, ladies and whatever present but you know it was you know it's good for access uh, as long as the local young people who are good at maths and uh, whatever um, uh, 
who would benefit from this. It, if he didn't have it, he was going to have or whatever it was. And as we all know, he strived and it has done exactly what it said on the tin. But again, he, he, that was at the heart of what he wanted to do. He had a vision in a way that was very long term in, in some ways, it was, it, and, and, and it was much driven by young people. Um, he was a passionate Exonian. I don't think he ever forgot his roots in the West Quarter. He was very proud of those. And never forgot that he was obviously a committed trade unionist and socialist, and he was a dedicated leader of the city council. Um, you might not have known this, um, but he was actually behind the scenes uh, a very kind and supportive person to work for. Um, and he was also a great fun. I think I would describe that very naughty twinkle in his eye. He would come into a room, and even whatever it was about, he knew that there was something on, or he'd he tell you a funny story, or, or whatever. Um, and at the risk of showing my age, I can't actually remember uh, being driven in a bus by Pete Edwards. So, uh, and at the time I wasn't a Labour councillor, I was something else, but he, he would always take time when I got the bus to uh, have, have a word with me and, and, and talk about what was going on at the council. Um, and I think, again, he was an important role model for working class people going into politics and coming on the council because, with no disrespect to two bus drivers or whoever, you know, anybody in this city looking at Pete said, well, I want to come on the council, it doesn't matter if I've been, I've been to university or whatever my background, if I've got the talents and the ability and I can work hard, I can become leader of the city council. And I think that's just such an important message to uh, send out. Um, I did play my small role in him, in his rise to leadership. Um, some of you may remember uh, the work I did with others in Exwick, um, deprived um, the, the then council leader of his seat, um, and created a vacancy for Pete to um, apply for as a deputy leader. Um, I will say what I had broken um, with the coalition government, and when my then husband and I came back to the Labour Party, we did mend up, we did put our toys back in the pram and um, bolster his position, um, especially uh, as the West Ex there was a, a desert for the Labour Party. I think it was to one or if not even no seats at, at one point. Um, but he, he never held that against me, put me on the executive. Um, and for many years I was one of his longest serving executive members and he did work closely on a huge range of issues and projects. I think like broadly covered housing, public realm, policing and customer services. And I think as Karina said, I, I sort of have a look back through some of the clippings and things and you just forget how much you did and, and you know, it was, and in those days the express method was daily, so you had to feed it daily with stuff, which um, I now look back and my God, how did we do that? Well, we did. Um, but I remember some key moments. Um, I was the portfolio for the public when the football stadium had to be renewed. And I remember going up to the football stadium, Pete and I sort of glued together, and it was, it was like the sort of Frankenstein movie. They were all there with their pitchforks ready to sort of burn me and Pete at the stake. Um, we went, we took it all, it was packed. I mean, I mean you know, we made the commitment to, to, to fulfill the new uh, state, stadium, and, and I, I agree with Council Walls. I, I have seen the, the, the film from the occasion, it was extremely uh, moving, and the tribute that they paid to he was instrumental. Um, I think I got um, considered in that process as an honorary woman, because, um, uh, which she often used to do to me. But I, was, I was there in name only as a portfolio, but it was very much Pete was doing it, and I was there as a, as a sort of token honorary woman, perhaps, at that, on that occasion. But nevertheless, we got it there. I remember the year we had the severe winter weather, and the refuse lorries, we decided we couldn't take them out, um, because it, it was snow everywhere. And it was a very difficult time for me, because my then father died and his wife died unexpectedly in Wales and I was coping with that, having to travel up to Swansea on only child, so it wasn't very, it wasn't very easy. At that time I also had the national newspapers calling for my resignation and I caught pneumonia as well, all of it. But nevertheless, um, there was a, a, a front page that I've still got back home somewhere where it's a picture of Peter and I on the front page and it said, I stand by my man because Despite the Sunday newspaper calling me Mr. Rubbish, he would not sack me because he thought I made the right decision and he stuck by me and that was how loyal he was. If he, if he thought that I'd done the right thing or we'd done the right thing collectively, he would, he would uh, stand by me. And, and the famous arguments, um, there was one occasion uh, where we had a meeting in the afternoon with Hazel Hall um, and it was about homelessness and housing and he came in and I could see that he was in a terrible mood um, and he said, it's all your fault, he said. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, all this homelessness and, and we've got it so bad in Exeter, it's your fault because you're too soft on it, all he said. He said, too many soup kitchens, he said, it's all, it's all wrong, he said, it's all your fault, he said. So a huge row uh, occurred and it was one of the rows that came to the horses so that people start looking out of offices and, th and thinking, um, you know, what on earth is going on here? And then about half an hour, 20 minutes into it, he burst out laughing and said, he said, yeah, you're right, he said. He said, you are right, he said. I had a meeting with all these business people this morning, and he said, they said that the council was too soft on it. He said, I wanted to test if you were doing the right things, he said. He said, you're quite right, he said. And, 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 it, and it went on, he said, he said, I wanted to crack in all the, the soup kitchens. And I said, I'm not going to um, close the soup kitchen. I didn't go into politics to close soup kitchens. I'm going to resign. He said, no, you're not going to resign. He said, it's going to be all over the Express and Echo. I'm going to look terrible. He said, he said, no. You know, and, and so, but again, he didn't like to be surrounded by yes people. He wanted to be tested. He wanted to test me and Casey Ball at the time that we were doing the right things, we, we had the right things in place, and we were at the same time caring and inclusive. And he needed to check, that was his way of checking with us, that we weren't just sort of ticking boxes. Um, and, I, and I think as well, you know, I think from my point of view, my proudest achievement working with it was the housing that we built that Kareem alluded to. In, in some good years, we were actually out building Plymouth and doing Bristol run for the money with council housing, of course, with the austerity and cuts that ended. But you know, we were really going some some years, you know, we, we were really making great progress. And also, a hidden side of Pete that I think not everybody knows about, he was actually a great champion and ally for the LGBT community. If he ever thought that I was being mistreated or was having a hard time, he was on that like a like a ton of bricks, there's no way that he would have me being mistreated like that. And it was actually, this we might surprise some of you, an early advocate for the trans community because as Councillor Viallet will remember, at one point you had several bus drivers who had transitioned um, into, in, into women and there was a famous Christmas party where one of the lady bus drivers had transitioned um, and nobody would dance with her at this do. Now, Pete might not wait for that man, he might not have, you know, made a speech about it, but he was the one that got up and had the first dance because not having her neglected or not enjoyed the occasion or being discriminated against just because she had transitioned like that. And I think that, that goes back to so many things. You might not have used the right language, you might not have always said the right thing, but his actions spoke for himself. Um, and the last time I saw Pete Bobby was in Morrison's, um, and um, you know, the time it was a bit more strict with social distancing, and, and I was in there, you know, going around and trying like we do. And I suddenly heard this, this booming voice, Hello, Rob, he said, bounded right up to me and gave me a hug. Look, all the rules in Morrison's, the social distancing and, and all the rest of it, because that was Pete. And, he wanted, and, and, and the conversation was about, how are you? How are you? What, what's going on? And what's new? And, you know, and I was, I was in, a, in a way, I was just pleased because he, he was sort of being, so the last time I saw him, which I think was, was a nice thing for me, at least. Um, last year's Lord Mayor, I was officiated at his last council meeting, um, and there's some fabulous photographs that have come out about that. But looking back again, that was a great honour for me, I think, to be able, on behalf of the whole council, to give him the gifts and the, and the tokens that we gave him. Um, and, and, and I think that was a lovely event that we did. Um, so I would end there, Lord Mayor, and I would say, Pete Edwards, much respected, much missed, and fondly remembered. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Rob. Could I call upon Councillor Kevin Mitchell to speak, please? Um, thank you, um, Lord Mayor. Um, a, a lot has already been said, so I'll try and be as, as brief as I can. But like the Lord Mayor, I knew people for a long period of time um, whilst I was on this council. Um, we had political banter. Um, we didn't always agree. Um, however, I always respected Pete. Uh, and I hope that he respected me too, uh, even when we quite had quite a lot of disagreement. However, I will not remember Pete for what occurred in this chamber. I will remember Pete for what happened outside of it, um, in the working groups and the private chats um, that occurred, um, as we do with all councillors. Pete actually had a very great sense of humour, um, as people um, have already stated. And he was also incredibly easy to get on with. 
and he was always willing to give advice, even when I didn't want the advice, but he would still give the advice. And he had a genuine warmth. As is already been alluded by Councillor Hannaford, um, I'll talk about one thing that really, really did touch me at the time. Um, as many of you will know, I put down a motion um, a few years ago about LGBTQ plus rights um, in Russia. And Pete listened, and he helped to ensure that I had time to sit down with the leaders of the Arab and express my concerns. I had to wait a while because they were very busy talking to Greg um, and others. Um, but when they came in, Pete brought them in, brought them over, and said to me, Here you go, lad, and then just wouldn't tell. And that was actually quite a touching moment, and then left us to enable us to have that conversation. So that proved to me, as Councillor Hanford has stated, that he did care, despite that rough exterior that we all know. And he also had a great passion um, and love for this city, and that cannot be denied. Rest in peace. Thank you, Kevin. Councillor Warwick, did I see your hand up? Councillor Warwick, and then the Council of War will access Councillor Warwick. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tony. I call upon Councillor Sheldon to speak, please. Totally independently in their own houses or going into care homes. 
um, it's not been an easy thing to work out how this is going to actually be managed and, and all of that discussion is still going on at the moment between us and Devon County Council, but between both councils we're convinced it's something that we need and that we're going to do. Um, so I'm really glad that um, we were decided to call it Edward's Court after Pete a while ago. So that will be one more legacy of his um, with regard to housing. Um, secondly, when I first got involved with the Labour Party and, and um, with Pete, it was there through canvassing. He was always brilliant at answering the 150 questions that I had in between open gateways and asking people how they were going to vote. I would be asking him about housing development, planning, about the pool, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and he was always really, really good at, at trying to give me really full answers, saying, I'll talk to you more if you want to give me a ring doll, it's all right. Um, that's another thing. The way he called us girls or doll, uh, he couldn't take offence because, as has already been said, he, he promoted young people. Um, people from the LG, I was it wrong, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, women, for him, he just wanted to see people doing a good job, people that would challenge and that would work hard. Um, so I never mind him calling, calling me doll, it was quite funny. Um, snap decisions that I thought he was making when I got to know him, I realised behind that there was an awful lot of um, informed and considered decision making, he really knew his stuff, he would give a bit of bluster and you'd, you'd think who is who is this guy that's just charging ahead and everyone had to follow in his wake, but the bluster he told me fairly recently was to cover up the fact that sometimes he felt he may be judged because he hadn't gone to university, um, because people might think he wasn't as educated as he should be in this position. Um, I find that a bit of an insight. I love this cluster. Um, it's quick decision making. Thank you for that, Pete. He rang me up one day and said, Doll, I want you to replace Anna on the executive um, in charge of housing. And I've only been a councillor for six months. So I said, There's no way I can't do that. And um, Bobby, you know, Bobby said, Yeah, it's what I want. Start tomorrow and put the phone down. Um, which some people may not think was a democratic decision, but um, I'm thanking him. For it. So, condolences to his family. He, he was a, a, a big bloke, a big heart, a big sense of humour, but incredibly, incredibly good at the job he did. Um, rest in peace, Pete. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I am uh, Luke, a councillor of service next, please. Thank you. Um, I just think I should speak on behalf of well, the many young councillors that have been promoted through the Labour Party um, and encouraged by Pete. I was only 20 years old when I, I was elected when I was 90, but at the age of 20 I got a call saying, can you come on the executive? And I said, Pete, I can't, I'm a second year at university. <laughs> um, and he said, right, okay, don't do that, but you've got to be a chair of scrutiny. And I said, right, okay, I could probably manage that one. Um, and without him, I wouldn't have probably been involved so much in the Labour Party as I have been over the last six years. Um, he is someone who I think we should all model as politicians. He had great authenticity, and I think um, in the political world, particularly at the moment, we lack authenticity and realness. And Pete was a genuine guy who genuinely cared about other people and the people he represented. And, um, I think your politicians, you know, particularly at the moment, should, should look to behave more like that. Um, he also made politics fun, which sounds difficult, but um, he did. Being in a meeting with Pete was not just entertaining, but also enlightening. Um, and I've got many fond memories of Pete making faux cars around uh, the table. Um, and I also think something we also lack is people being comfortable around people who might disagree with them. And I'll always remember, I was chair of the scrutiny at the time when the Clifton, I don't really want to mention it, but the Clifton Hill issue had come up and our scrutiny had made it quite clear that we disagreed with what the executive wanted to say. And I had to ring him up as a member of his own group. I said, Pete, I've got to go to a call and I've got to call in a decision and, and disagree basically. 
And he said, do what the F you want, mate. Um, <laughs> and that was Pete, you know. Um, I don't think many leaders of a council would be that encouraging of um, disagreement, but I think it actually probably helped make the right decision in the end. He was definitely a friend of the LGBT community. He always called me Lukey Bain. And I have lots of fond memories of him, um, and I think he is someone that politicians today should certainly look up to and model their behaviour on. He is, um, was a formidable force, uh, a great character, and will be sorely missed. And I am pleased his legacy will live on with projects and uh, you know the great tributes that we've heard this evening. So thank you, Pete, for many reasons. Thank you, Luke. I emailed Pete as an anonymous resident, completely unknown to him. Coming from me, it was a rather wordy email, at least a page and a half they call. I got six words back, I'll see what I can do. He did, and he sorted it. You don't need to know what it was, but it improved my life and the life of other people in Exeter. When I finally got to meet him, I mentioned to him that I took, I taught his lovely uh, granddaughter, Katie, and his eyes just lit up. And that was Pete, the family man, who loved his family, and they loved him. And he loved his Labour family too, and especially those of you who've known him a long time. I feel that love coming over tonight, and it's been an emotional time. Um, I think your words will be great comfort to his family. And I suggest now we take a five minute comfort break and just go and use the facilities, maybe have a drink of water, think about the grateful to Pete, and then we'll come back and continue with the meeting in five minutes.
I'll tell you the spirit teacher. Right, in honour of Pete, we're going to rattle through this so the meeting finishes before the pub closes. Before we formally commence this evening's business, can I please remind all members of the following? Please remain focused on the topic being discussed. Please don't repeat points which have already been made. Please avoid interrupting other councillors and respect the position of the Lord Mayor. Please indicate if you wish to speak a show of hands, I will then call you as appropriate with John's help. Please remember that this meeting is still being broadcast in the normal way via Facebook Live, so members of the public can still see and hear what's being said and decided. This brings us to the first item on the agenda, which relates to the minutes of the ordinary and extraordinary meetings of Council held on 21st of July 2021. May I ask if someone is prepared to move the minutes of the meeting held on 21st of July as a correct record of the proceedings? I'd like to move, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Is there a seconder? A second, Lord Mayor. Thank you. All in favour? Thank you. The next item of business, when I find, probably a short signature. Um, the next item of business is agenda number three. Members will be aware that they have a statutory responsibility to attend at least one meeting of the authority every six months. If they fail to do this, they are disqualified with immediate effect unless the council has agreed to an extension of this period of absence. Council quants last attended the annual general meeting on 18th of May 2021, meaning that he will have to attend the meeting by 18th of November to be within the six month period. Councillor Pont has not been well enough to attend the meeting since May. I know he very much wanted to come tonight, but was unable to. And so I would like to ask members to consider approving an extension for any further absence by him up to the end of the 21-22 municipal year. Is someone prepared to propose this? Moved that, Lord Mayor. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I'll take that as Council Ward or seconding. All in favour? Any against? Thank you, that's clearly carried. The next item on the agenda as item number three is to advise you of some official communications. I wish to pay tribute to Rick Lawrence, a valued colleague at the museum who died last month. He was a good friend and a colleague to many. I also pay tribute on behalf of us all to Sir David Amos, so shockingly killed this week. I'm pleased to hear the Queen intends to grant Southend-on-Sea city status in honour and memory of him. In my mayor-making speech on July, in July, I spoke of Devon Disability Collective which provides opportunities for disabled people to work and sells a plethora of useful products. Councillor Olcock sits on their board as a representative of Exeter City Council and Councillor Atkinson for Devon County Council. We support them as they support us, reducing inequality. Joe Mann, chair of the board, was the beating heart of Devon Disability Collective. Tragically, on the morning of 12th of August, he died in a light aircraft crash. I had the honour of attending Joe's funeral where his life was celebrated. Joe became a Labour member in 1979, sat on the NEC, and was elected to Exeter City Council in 1994, giving Exeter a majority Labour administration for the first time. 
He was a passionate trade unionist, and his work with community union contributed to changes which were enshrined in law, both in the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995 and in the Equality Act 2000. Roy Rickles, General Secretary of Community, spoke of Joe's life and legacy at his funeral, saying, his dedication and fortitude led to changes that will impact every worker for generations to come. Only 7% of learning disabled adults of working age are in employment, and this was a particular concern and passion for Joe. When he retired, he used his experience here in Exeter. National government funding for our PLUS factory, providing employment for disabled people, was stopped in 2014. Joe supported the workers in their desire to set up a cooperative social enterprise and served as chair on the board of trustees until his sudden and untimely death. In honour of Joe, community have funded an IT suite and welfare facilities needed to take forward Joe's vision of an apprenticeship for disabled people. I am delighted to tell you that Exeter City Council have agreed to work in partnership with Devon Disability Collective to create this apprenticeship scheme as a living and lasting memorial for Joe. Victoria Hatfield's team have already begun this work and Neymar will oversee it. A truly fitting tribute for Joe. In other news, it has been a busy time for the city. I enjoyed Gareth Steenson's freemanship ceremony in recognition of years of service to the club, the sport and the city. It was great to welcome his friends and family to the Guildhall and the offer of running sheep through the city, which is now his right through the high street, was also extended to him. On the theme of sport, we wish success to all participants in the forthcoming International Women's Rugby Tournament and to England's Red Roses rugby team in their match at Sandy Park against New Zealand's Black Ferns at the end of the month. Last week I led the procession for the High Sheriff of Devon's legal service at Exeter Cathedral. The service was attended by many members of the judiciary, judges, barristers, council and emergency service leaders and other alleged dignitaries who all took part from across the region. I also discovered that the ancient legal office of recorder has been reinstated. I also attended the Cold Stream Guards Association annual lunch and the Exeter Hindu Temple Snabrati celebrations, both on the same day. Quite a contrast. Following its opening, which I was pleased that Pete was able to attend, I'm pleased to announce that the newly opened Exeter bus station has been shortlisted for a prestigious regional award in the building of the year over 5 million category of the Mitchell Moore Law Property Awards. We held a one day exhibition on the new local plan for Exeter and the online consultation runs until 15th of November so please take the opportunity to join in and encourage residents to. The Guildhall hosted another successful Lord Mayor's Coffee Morning last Saturday. Um, we look forward to welcoming visitors to our historic, historic Guildhall Hall. And we raised funds for Inclusive Exeter, the leading diversity charity in our city. And finally, in August, one of our own, Deputy Chief Executive Bindu Arjun was appointed as the new Chair of Corporation for Exeter College. We're very proud of the contribution she is making towards supporting young people in the city. I am drawing the curtain of charity around my COP26 co-bike challenge this evening. But my mum told me, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So I hope to have a positive update for you soon. This now brings us to the next item on the agenda at agenda number four, which is the opportunity for members of the public to submit an advanced public question. 
I am glad to confirm we have received no public questions. The next business on the agenda are the minutes of the various committees of the Council that have been held over the last few months since our meeting in July. Can I please remind all members that the relevant chair will present the minutes of their meeting on block and then ask if members have any questions to raise on matters which have been resolved. Or any on any recommendations, there will be an opportunity for debate on these matters. I will move to each chair of committees in turn. However, when it comes to the minutes of the executive, the leader will present the minutes one by one, drawing particular attention to each and every recommendation so that members and the public are aware where decisions by full council need to be taken. An individual vote will then be taken on each recommendation from executive to council. So may I first call on Councillor Morse as Chair of Planning Committee to introduce a number of meetings of the Planning Committee, commencing at Agenda Number 6 with the minutes of the committee held on 28th of June, starting on page 25. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I present the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting Monday the 28th of June 2021? Do I have any questions? I beg to move, Lord Mayor. Could I present the uh, minutes of the Planning Committee dated the 6th of September 2021, Lord Mayor? Do I have any questions? I beg to move, Lord Mayor. I now call on Councillor Buswell as Chair of Licensing Committee to introduce the minutes of that committee held on 14th of September at Agenda Number 8, starting on page 53. Thank you. Can I now call on Councillor Sills as Chair of Strategic Scrutiny Committee to introduce the minutes of that committee held on the 23rd of September at Agenda Item 9 starting on page 57. I'd like to move the minutes of the Strategic Scrutiny Committee held on the 23rd of September 2021. Are there any questions? I beg to move, Lord Mayor. They're moved. Thank you, Councillor Sills. I now call on Councillor Wardle as Chair of Audit and Governance Committee to introduce the minutes of that committee held on 28th of July at Agenda Number 10, starting on page 55. I understand there is one recommendation for Council approval. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> I wish to present the minutes of the meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee held on the 28th of July, 2021. And in relation to minutes number 55, I want to move the recommendation for council approval for minute 55. Do I have a second? Councillor um, Anderson, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Anderson, so, it is recommended to Council to note and approve the annual governance statement included in the Council's annual statement of accounts for 2020 to 21. There's now an opportunity for debate if anybody wishes to speak. Then to a vote. Can all in favour of the recommendation please raise their hand? That's clearly carried. Thank you. Thank you. Now can I call on Councillor Wardle? 
again as chair of audit and governance committee to introduce the minutes of the committee held on 29th of september and agenda number 11 starting on page 69. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I wish to present the minutes of the meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee held on 29th September 2021. I, I, I move those minutes. Okay, thank you, Councillor Thank you. Order. I second. They're moved, they're seconded. Great. The next item at agenda number 12 are the minutes of the Strata Joint Scrutiny Committee held on 12th of July 2021 and I call on Councillor Atkinson as a member of the committee to introduce the minutes starting on page 75. I uh, move the uh, adoption of the minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'll to take any questions. Here yes, there aren't any questions. So I will call on Councillor Pierce as deputy of the Exeter Harbour Board, or at least a member, to introduce the minutes of that meeting held on 27th of September at agenda number 13, starting on page 79. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to present the minutes of the meeting of the Harbour Board held on 27th of September 2021. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Diana Moore, please. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I noted the comments from the port users group about poor water quality caused by sewage and field uh, runoff. And so I was wondering um, whether the chair would be interested, would be able to, when the board meets to discuss its purpose, would um, the members of the Harbour Board be encouraged to consider the Harbour Board's purpose and responsibilities from the point of view of its impact on wildlife and the environment? and the achievement of the net zero 2030 goal. We don't have the chair with us tonight, um, Diana, which is Councillor Harvey. Councillor Bialik, would you like to answer that or would you like Councillor Pierce to? Well, um, as it's a sort of a policy thing to look forward to, uh, if yes, we look at that, I, I would add that uh, we already, well, we were, although those who know come to a bit of an end, we had a South West Water Liaison meeting, which um, some of us used to attend. That's sort of been dismantled really through lack of interest, although uh, there are still meetings between the Water Authority from time to time. But what we were certainly do, I was talk to the portfolio holder, the director responsible, and of course, it, it makes sense and it is appropriate for the Harbour Board to look at that. If we are responsible, then we will. Any further questions? No? Great. Thank you. If there are no further questions, Lord Mayor, I'd like to move the minutes. Thank you very much, Councillor Pierce, for putting me right on that. The minutes are moved. Um, can I now call on you, Councillor Bialik, as Chair of Executive, to introduce the minutes of the two executive meetings, the first being held on the 7th of September 2021, Agenda number 14 starts on page 85. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Minute 78, minute 79, minute 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and there is a recommendation here. Uh, Lord Mayor, that the Council note the statutory annual air quality status report. I'd like to move that recommendation, Lord Mayor. Okay, so recommendation means that we have the opportunity to debate, is that right? Oh, as soon as I've got a second there. Councillor Wright, thank you for seconding. Councillor Sparling, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, the 2020 Air Quality Annual Status Report showed us that air quality within Exeter can be improved considerably. However, this reduction was not due to the policies or infrastructure we currently have in place, but was instead due to forced behaviour changes from the COVID-19 pandemic. I have two questions for us today. Uh, firstly, can the portfolio holder confirm how the Council intends to respond to the World Health Organisation's new air quality guidance? 
which strongly suggests the target for nitrogen dioxide should be 75% lower than the current legal limit. During 2020, only two of Exeter's 67 monitors achieved the 75% reduction target, with both of these being in an urban setting. And secondly, will the Council refer Air Quality Annual Status Report to the relevant scrutiny committee for full and proper discussion to ensure all actions taken achieve the safer levels required to protect our communities and the lives of Exeter's residents from polluted air? Thank you. Can I ask Councillor Bialik if he would like to reply? Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, on the first issue with regard to the World Health Organization, I can assure you whatever responses we are to make as a city council, we will carry out our legal responsibilities if we are required to do so. Uh, with regard to the other issues, uh, I hope you don't mind, I assume you read them from something that was prepared. It may be helpful if you send that email to me, I will ask the, um, the team to have a look at it. And we must always remember uh, and as I feel sure you're, you do know that the, this is an annual status report. Uh, we are responsible for doing this, although we are not responsible for how we deliver it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not within our power. Uh, they haven't given us the power, let them give it to us and I think we'll find we'll do a lot of changes. But I do get what you said about the behaviour and all that sort of thing. But if you wouldn't mind, sending that to us, I will ask the team to have a look at it and get you a reply which I will share with all the councillors, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. Are there any other people that wish to speak in this debate on this recommendation? I see no hands. Thank you, members. Is someone prepared to move this recommendation? I could move the Lord Mayor at the start. Did you? Okay. I must listen more attentively. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Wright. Did you second it at the start? <laughs> yes. Apologies. Are there any members who wish to vote against this recommendation? Any abstentions? Thank you, members. Uh, all in favour? Those numbers show there is a clear majority in favour of the recommendation, so I declare that it is carried. Minute 86, minute 87, minute 88, Lord Mayor, I think, is it minute 88? Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, let me just get my head around this. I've got two piles of paper here. Um, you've introduced those minutes, that's the Bialik, and now there's an opportunity for members to ask a question Correct. to resolve the matter. Absolutely. Okay, Councillor Diana Moore, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, that is a question that will help both of us, mainly for me answering questions from residents, but it'd be really good to hear for the record. Um, the move, um, the um, moving of the Bell Isle Depot um, people are worried that this includes part of the park and I'm sure of them that it isn't and I just think it would be helpful if we just clarify for the minutes that it doesn't include any of the park um, in any of the proposed developments. So um, I'd be grateful if you could um, just affirm that position. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to lay this to rest and to stop a Twitter storm on this potential issue. The clue councillor and to the residents is in the title, Bell Isle Depot, not Bell Isle Park, Bell Isle Depot. We are not doing anything to the park. In actual fact, proposals may well end up coming to enhance it, but uh, that will obviously be dealt with through planning. So I can assure, I can assure people, I have to say a few things three times now, I can assure everybody that we have no plans no plans to seek to develop Bell Isle Park. Just once more, we have no plans to seek to develop Bell Isle Park. Thank you. Thank you. That would be very helpful for both of us. 
Okay, so that's a resolved matter. You can move them, Councillor Gillick. <coughs> Anyone want to second? Second, yes, brilliant. Okay. What minute number are we on, please, Councillor Gillick? We're on the uh, agenda item 15, Lord Mayor. Tuesday, the executive of Tuesday the 5th of October 2021. Thank you. And I start with minute 89, minute 90, 91, 92, 93, Lord Mayor. 94, Government Consultation on Giving Police and Crime Commissioners Greater Powers of Competence. And it is recommended, Lord Mayor, that we approve the response to the Government Consultation, which were attached to the Executive Minutes on Granting of Police and Crime Commissioners Greater Powers of Competence. I so move, Lord Mayor. Do we have a seconder? A second, Lord Mayor. Okay. This is a recommended item so we can have a debate and I'm going to call first upon Councillor Hannaford. Thank, thank you Lord Mayor. Um, I'm sure we all welcome the greater uh, closer work and it's alluded to in these few measures. Um, but could the Deputy Leader of the Council please confirm uh, with us the work that she's been doing as a member of the Peace and Crime Panel in terms of enhancing in particular women's safety in the city because we have had some extremely serious incidents recently and I think it's very important that we flag up and are made aware of the work that is going on behind the scenes. Thank you Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you Lord Mayor. Um, in relation to these actual minutes, this is pushing the boundaries a, a little bit perhaps but it is sort of related, thank you Councillor Hannaford, because the minutes that uh, are here for us to recommend the greater um, powers of competence for the Police and Crime Commissioner, commissioner will perhaps um, encompass the work that she's been doing 
um, and the work that the Police and Crime Panel have been um, doing with her and to oversee the work. So yes, there's a, a lot of um, things that have been brought forward um, to try and improve the streets and environments um, and to mitigate um, sexual violence and harassment against women and girls. So I think uh, what Councillor Harper is referring to is uh, work that through the panel I've um, advised the Police and Crime Commissioner to make a greater statement about this and to bring forward the importance and the prominence of the work that's been undertaken to uh, not only to try to mitigate against sexual violence and harassment for to women and girls but also to uh, nip it in the bud by better education of the perpetrators of that violence. So hopefully if we uh, do recommend this minute, that will help the Police and Crime Commissioner to bring forth that, um, among other things, for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Does anybody else wish to speak in the debate on this recommendation? I see no hands. I think we will therefore move to the vote. All in favour? Looks like it's clearly carried to me. Unan unanimously carried. Excellent. Councillor Bialik, do you want to move us on to the next minute? 95. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, minute 95, overview of the general fund revenue budget 21-22 for the first quarter. And there are four recommendations in the papers. I formally move, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, recommendations, so again, opportunity to debate. I will look for hands. I see no hands, so I will move it to the vote. All in favour? Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Yes. That's clearly carried. Item 96, Lord Mayor, General Fund Capital Monitoring Statement, Quarter 1. And here I would like to formally move the two recommendations attached in the paper. I shall move, Lord Mayor. Councillor Wright, thank you for seconding. Again, we have an opportunity to debate. I will look around the room for hands. Councillor Diana Moore, first, please. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I hope the leader found my notes on antisocial behaviour in the Shohei area useful. And that's something we've done fall under this budget, we can follow up afterwards. So, my question in relation to this is please, can the leader update me on discussions with the King Canal Trust and have you managed to persuade the trustees to make up the balance of this capital project? The simple answer to that question, Councillor Moore, is that meeting has not taken place yet, but I intend to raise it, as I do uh, with the other issues raised in the minute with the police, and I have raised it with the Police and Crime Commissioner, and I think it's Jim Dye in the area, but these things sort of move at a certain pace. But that will not lead to bringing forward the Mallison Bridge before anything else at this time. We've really got to look at where we spend our money and I have to prioritise. I feel sure I will be um, uh, kicked and made to regret that because something will happen and I'll get the blame for it all, of course. But that is our position at this moment in time. It remains on the list, but it's not a priority at this particular moment in time, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. Councillor Kevin Mitchell, would, I believe you would like to speak. Oh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yes, I'd like to ask a question of clarification, if I may, on the third bullet point um, within the minute, um, which is reference to £50,000 per annum, um, which has been requested for the purchase of IT equipment to include obviously, new iPads for councillors. Um, just one clarification on the cost 
for councillors' iPads and what the rest of the money for that £50,000 will be spent on. Just a bit of detail, please, would be helpful. Thank you. Well, clearly, uh, Lord Mayor, this is a provision of a budget. I certainly hope we fall under the budget. Clearly, your iPad must be okay because you called it up and you could see the minutes and everything else. But to be serious, um, uh, they've not been replaced for eight, nine years, some of them. Uh, we've had a very good recycling policy. We need to look at it, and that's what we've done. The portfolio responsible for it is the deputy leader, and what I think it will become apparent to all members in due course exactly what that provision is, and I will make sure that cost is clearly um, made aware to everybody. I would add, we need to have the correct tools to do the job, to represent people in our wards, and to represent ourselves on the City Council. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other hands, so I will move to the vote on this recommendation. All in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, four abstentions, but that is clearly carried. Can we move on to minute 97, please, Councillor Bia? Thank you. And just to say to Kevin Mitchell, I get, I just. Uh, 97 HRA Budget Monitoring Report, Quarter 1. There are two recommendations here. I formally move, Lord Mayor. Seconded, Lord Mayor. Okay, we'll move to debate on these recommendations. If anybody wishes to speak, please raise your hand. We are rattling through. In that case, I move to the vote. All in favour, please. That's unanimously carried. Excellent. Let's move on to minute 98. Review of Council's governance uh, arrangements. Here is a recommendation. Uh, Lord Mayor, which is three major points with some subsections. I formally move these recommendations, Lord Mayor. I second them, Lord Mayor. Thank you. We now move to debate on these recommendations again. I'm looking for hands. I see Councillor Hannaford, so if you would like to speak first. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd just like to draw attention. I, I chair this um, working party um, in, to, in regards to the final bullet point, which is to request that the petition signatories must be led to a tick box facility on petition form, of which the eligible criteria for living, working, or studying in Exeter they rely upon in signing the petition. Um, I, I think I just want to highlight that for everybody that's so important when we're looking at local issues within the city that we, we know where the lobbying and the representations are coming from. Um, with all due respect, it's no good if you live in Birmingham or Edinburgh and they're petitioning us on something that affects the citizens of Exeter. It must be tied into you know, the fact that they, you know, they preferably they, they, they live here and are registered to vote here or, or at stretch work here because I do think the system has been abused um, on several issues uh, in, in recent times, where we've had a large number of signatures come in on a controversial local member, and then, or even a planning application as well. And it's, I don't think it's genuinely appropriate that you know people living outside the area or, or even internationally in some cases should be unduly influencing the business of this council. So I think it's just important to flag up. I think this is one of the most important changes that we've agreed cross party. Uh, on that body, and uh, I recommend it for your approval. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hannaford. I can't see any other hands raised, and so I suggest we move to the vote. All in favour of the recommendation, please. I think that seems unanimous. Do you agree, John? Numbers could clearly show that we can help. Yes, it would. Yes, bit of keep fit, hands up high, and down again. Yes, that's clearly carried. Uh, Lord Mayor, also on minute 98, it's resolved. Uh, there's um, four, uh, five resolved points which people could ask a question if they 
So I wish Lord Mayor just to say that. Thank you. Anybody wanting to ask questions on those resolved matters? Minute 99, Lord Mayor. Amendments to the scheme of uh, delegation. And here there is one recommendation which I formally move. Second it, Lord Mayor. Thank you. It is a recommendation. You all have the opportunity for debate. Please raise your hands nice and high if you'd like to speak. As nobody is, I will move to the vote. All in favour of that recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Is that unanimous? I'm not sure. Is anybody against? Anyone abstaining? No, I think it's unanimous, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Minute 100, Minute 101, Lord Mayor, it's a resolved matter, but there is one recommendation, and I believe if we need to go into discussion on that, we will have to go into part two. If that is the case, I would suggest, as I'm about to say, with regard to item 102, to move that into part two, which would follow this uh, executive. But people need to tell me if they want, sorry, this meeting, if they want 101 to go into that as well. Okay, so uh, I so move the, well, I don't have to move the resolved uh, matter. I need total accord, Councillor Bialik, that we will deal with those in part Thank you. Which we will do at the end of the remainder of this. Those meeting. are the minutes, Lord Mayor, and so therefore I so move. Thank you very much, Councillor Bialik. Um, thank you, members. We've been working very hard, I see. This brings us to item 16 on the agenda, which relates to seeking a new chair of the Strategic Scrutiny Committee. Are there any nominations? Lord Mayor, I'd like to move Councillor Barbara Delling. Okay, do we have a seconder? Does Councillor Wright to say I've made any other nominations? Councillor Bernamore? I would like to nominate Councillor Kevin Mitchell. Okay, so we have Barbara. Have we got a seconder for Kevin? Yep, we've got Amy Sterling seconding. Any other nominations? Right, so we have two nominations. Let me consult my paper because this will mean we will have, they've both been nominated and seconded. I am going to have to ask in turn. So can I please ask first all those in favour of Councillor Denning to raise their hands now. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Could I now ask all those in favour of Councillor Kevin Mitchell to raise their hands? Thank you. I declare Councillor Dennis. Oh, very sorry, Councillor Henson. Councillor Henson has abstained. I forgot to give her the opportunity. But Lord, I please... Lord Mayor, would you indulge me for a moment? I will indulge you, Councillor Bialik. That last item. I think I would like to, hopefully, on behalf of the Council, register our thanks to Councillor Luke Sills, who has stepped out from this job. He's done a good job during the since he's been uh, doing the uh, chair of this particular scrutiny. Uh, he's not falling out with anybody that I know of. Luke has taken a promotion within school, and I admire him for that, for looking after over 200 children. I had enough looking after two, and to look after 200, I applaud him and seriously thank him on behalf of the council for the work that he's done in that role as scrutiny chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. I add my thanks, and I'm sure everybody else here admires you, Luke, managing 200 children. I would also like to declare Councillor Denning is now chair of Strategic Scrutiny Committee. Thank you, members. That brings us to agenda item 17 on the agenda, which relates to notices of motions from members in accordance with Standing Order 6. 
I can confirm that we have received two notices of motion. The first one from Councillor Pierce, the details of which are set out on your agenda papers. Councillor Pierce, can you please read us your notice of motion? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'd just take this opportunity to take the motion as read if possible, just so we can move the agenda on. Much appreciated. I don't think we even need to vote on that. Um, so, what do we need to do now, John? Do we need a second of the motion? Oh, we've got plenty. Go for Councillor Atkinson. Um, any, do we have an opportunity for questions? Yes, of course we do, and debate. So, anybody who wishes to speak on this topic? Please raise your hand. Councillor Ledbetter, please. And then it will be Councillor Michael. Oh, the information. I wasn't seconding the motion. I was moving, seconding that we move without speaking to it. Did I get that wrong? Uh, hang on. It could be you. It could be me. I will seek the guidance of several public services. I thought you were asking for... Okay, so I'm not seconding the motion. So, so Councillor Atkinson is not seconding the motion. You just wait a moment, Councillor Ledbetter. Oh, Councillor Sheldon is willing to second. Councillor Sheldon has seconded. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you for your patience. Councillor Ledbetter, please. Thank you. This really, this really questions because I, I don't fully understand this. So, obviously, I think we all agree that everybody should pay fair tax, corporations and, and individuals, of course. Um, but when we get to the actual res uh, resolution, I'd like to know how the council is going to lead by example and demonstrate this practice in its tax conduct, how it's going to ensure contractors will implement the IR35, how it's going to make sure that they don't use offshore vehicles, and how will it undertake due diligence to ensure that these lot of construction is being used. So we'd like some clarity about how this is actually going to work. Thank you. We don't understand that. Councillor Sheldon, would you like to speak now or would you like to reserve your right and speak at the end before Councillor appears? Okay, you reserve your right, Councillor Sheldon, which means we'll move on. Well, do we move on or do we answer the question? Uh, Phil, Phil, could you answer oh, the question? In my contribution, I support the motion, particularly the principle of the motion. And this principle is for fair taxation. That is the principle. And we need to ensure, and we do need to lead by example, we need to set uh, the record straight with a lot of people. You raise a number of interesting points, Councillor Ledbetter, and you're quite right. It will bring us difficulty. And I can assure you that we will operate uh, within the confines that we already do. We already pay our taxes as a city council, which I'm very pleased to do and we will clearly operate in that way. And if there is a variance from any of that, it will come back to executive and to the council, of course. But I suppose if somebody doesn't make that first step, nothing will happen at the end of the day. So I support the motion in the spirit that it's put forward. We will clearly have to look at the um, what is asked of us, and if we can, we, we will, and if we can't, we will have to report back, if that is the case, if it's a variance of what we're doing at the moment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'll now go to Councillor Michael Mitchell, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, just follow up the question of Councillor Lebo, but I'm coming to a slightly different uh, angle to this. I fully support the vision behind the motion. I don't think anybody sensibly can disagree with the, the views uh, that are expressed in the motion. And also, if you look on the websites that are connected with this, you see a large number of national and international companies have signed up uh, to this. So um, that is all to be commended. My only concern, sitting here as a councillor, looking at the recommendations, which are going to be fairly standard set up by other councils, is the resource information of the councillor fully carrying these out. Now, I think I would understand from Councillor Bialy now. Uh, that in relation to these demands, we need to look at our resource base, both in that part and the cost of doing some of these things, particularly at item six, where we're expected to trace the ownership. 
uh, and beneficial users of our suppliers. And we've got a very large supply chain in the number of organizations associated with the council. I understand already from a uh, finance officer that IR35 is an implemented legal requirement which is already carried out. Uh, so whilst I fully support the principles behind it, I think we as a council, as Councilor Riley has said, we need to look at what we can do within those recommendations based on the limited resources we have available. So I would rather resources go into frontline services. As much as I support this, uh, than these recommendations at this particular time. Thank you, Councillor Michael Mitchell. I think it may be useful if people are in agreement. I see Councillor Atkinson wants to speak. I know your point, but I think once Councillor Sheldon is able to speak and Councillor Pierce to sum up, they may be able to explain a little bit more of the detail of this. Obviously, I'm a neutral chair here, but this is a something that previously I looked at before COVID and I don't think people are totally grasping how I understood it yet. And I think we would welcome some clarification from Councillor Sheldon and Councillor Pierce in due course. The, but, but we are bearing your question in mind. I think it will be answered in that summing up. And if everyone's happy, we will move to Councillor Atkinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I just wanted to support this motion. I think it's the right thing to do, as Councillor Ledbetter said, and Kevin Mission, uh, uh, Mitchell has, has said as well. This has cross-party support, and the only question, as has been said, is how we can drive this forward. Well, in order to have a plan, you have to have a vision. And I think this is the first stage in doing that. And a very sensible suggestion for Councillor Mitchell is we work out that plan in accordance with our resources. But we're not alone in this. There are lots of other councils looking at just how to implement that, and we can work together with them and other organisations. So, for instance, there is a lot of good work going on in the local authority pension schemes, the local um, uh, joint organisations, to look at all aspects, environmental, social and governance issues, within companies with which the pension funds invest. And they publish those result, um, results um, and are uh, available out there to look at. We already have an obligation to look at our supply chains in relation to um, um, uh, uh, slavery, modern slavery, and whether at the end of that any of our contractors are engaged in employing slavery. Sorry, I've got some feedback there. Um, so I think um, there is an organisation like the Good Law Project, there are lots of organisations out there that are looking into this. This also has international support, so I think Governor, um, uh, President Biden announced that they've come to some agreement on paying fair taxes internationally, um, so I'm sure we will be able to get a lot of support for implementing this going forward. Thank you. Oh, and one last point. On the due diligence, of course, we do have an ordinate governance um, committee. We always look at our annual governance statement, which was, uh, again, approved today. And I'm sure we could work into that some um, way of uh, looking at, um, um, together with our auditors, uh, some, some aspects of this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. In the absence of other hands, I'm now going to ask Councillor Sheldon to speak, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm delighted to say that this motion, um, as has been said, we, we all agree we should pay tax. Um, the real world would probably reveal that a lot of people say that they don't actually do it. Um, and that's why certainly people earn large amounts of money helping people pay tax, or rather not. Um, if you earn this £50,000 a year, you pay on your income. A lot of the tax should be paid with a smile, um, and I've tried that, but apparently they didn't have any of the money. Um, and um, I'll, I'll quote um, a Supreme Court Justice of the United States, which must have been to, um, who was actually nominated by Theodore Roosevelt, who, um, despite what I thought, was actually a Republican, apparently. And he said, taxes are what we pay for civilized society. Um, and there are going to be firms that we probably get business to now who, if we implement this, are not going to get it anymore. Um, so our money will be going towards public services rather than sending William Shatner into space, potentially. 
um, which used to be what you do if you manage to avoid paying a lot of tax. Um, go to the point about what it's going to cost us to do this um, on number six, demanding clarity. That's the whole point. We're demanding clarity from the supplier to tell us who their ultimate owners are. We're not going to start with a white sheet of paper and start researching and finding out. They're going to tell us, and you've simply got to verify it rather than start from the beginning. And that's a much quicker and simpler task to do. And as has already been alluded, you know, we are working far more at the in association with others. And obviously, what one member of the group has checked the um, ultimate beneficial owner of the supplier, everyone else doesn't have to do it as well. Um, and it's getting late, so I'm looking much better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Sheldon. Could you sum up for us, Councillor Pierce? Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm just going to keep to a couple of very brief uh, comments, um, as I think some of the questions have already been answered quite fully um, already. But, you know, paying tax is viewed as a burden. And really, it's probably the biggest bargain we ever get in what we buy. It provides so much help for so many in our communities. I think as a recipient of a significant, but sadly, seemingly ever decreasing amount of public money, um, I think it falls on us to be responsible and set standards. This is something that other councils, other large international corporations, with presence of the Inetitor, and even those who are headquartered here, like the Penon Group, um, have adopted. They're setting the standard. We can follow with them. And as one of the key sort of anchor institutions of this city, it's a great, great opportunity to say to others, this is where we lead. It's time for you to follow, like we've done with the Passive House and so many other things in the past protection of green spaces, which goes, we've talked about many times tonight. The council leads, the city follows. I think this is a great opportunity for us to continue that legacy um, and keep delivering on that for people. Um, it was just really, I've been pleasantly surprised actually to hear so much support from so many different parties represented here tonight. Um, and the only negatives or blocks that seem to be produced are about resource allocation, and it's back to that ever dwindling resource that we've got. And I think it was um, the response by the leader and my and the seconder, Councillor Sheldon, really to sum this up. We're asking anybody who does business with us to do that due diligence. For them, they're going to come as part of their um, application, part of their tendering process, and say, here is our structures. We're not going to have to be doing you know, microscopic audits of these, of these companies and, and sort through their structures. That's not what this is about. This is about setting the standard um, and then following it. You know, there's so much support for this, um, as Councillor Atkinson said, not just locally, but internationally, um, as was witnessed by the um, declarations very recently for a global minimum corporation tax of 20%, which now many, many countries are going to be working towards. Um, so, you know, fair tax is something that is popular with everybody. It's, we all know it's the right thing to do. Um, businesses know it's the right thing to do. That's why they're signing up for this scheme as well. Um, so I just uh, commend this motion to you all, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce and all other members who contributed. I now move to the vote on the, this notice of motion. Can all those in favour of the motion please show now with a firm raise of your hand? Thank you, John. Any against? Any abstentions? Oh, that's carried. Right, thank you, members. The notice of motion is one. This brings us to the second notice of motion from a member. It's agenda item 18 on the agenda in accordance with standing order 6, the details of which are set out on your agenda papers. Councillor Wright, are you going to read out your motion or would you like to take it as read? Can I request that we take it as read, please, Lord Mayor? Thank you very much. I think everybody will be happy with that. I'm sure everybody's read it. Um, we can therefore see if there is a seconder for this motion. Councillor Amal, the same. Thank you. You seconded. So we will now move to a debate and I will ask you, Councillor Hussain, if you would like to speak now or reserve your right to speak at the end prior to Councillor Wright. I'll speak now. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Gassay. Uh, your microphone, that'd be great. Uh, this motion is hardly controversial and the asks is rather modest. The universal credit uplift was targeted at those who are in most need in our society. Um, and it's rather puzzling to me why it should be removed in the current economic circumstances where prices of food and fuel are rocketing. Universal credit provision was inadequate even before COVID-19 struck. And the government knew that. That is why they introduced the uplift in the first tranche of COVID-19 relief. This uplift had been taken away on the premise that there are lots of jobs available now. These jobs, we are told, will pay decent wages um, and, uh, and will lift everybody out of uh, needing to have this uplift. However, what we're seeing is that employers are doing exactly the opposite. We've already heard of some employers, like Clarks, are sacking their workforce and would only take them back if they reduce the wages, except less. Again, let me just remind everybody that in Exeter, 43% of all UC, uh, pe uh, people on UC are in employment or were in employment at the time. Uh, it, it is the suffering that is going to be borne by our citizens from the withdrawal of this lift it, it, it is immense and it's our duty uh, to speak out and urge government to review their decision and reconsider and hopefully raise um, uh, in payment levels in light of inflation of food, fuel and rent. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gassay. Councillor Leppard, if you wish to speak. Well, yeah, I'm going to be brief. Just to say, um, we're very happy to support number one. We're happy with an urgent review. We can't support number two because it's, it's just an open ended thing. I mean, you, it, it could, could come back at any figure. So we're wondering if you'll, you'll take the two items and vote on them separately. We're happy to support number one. can't support number two. Thank you. I've been looking at the indices of multiple deprivation and the changes between 2015 and 2019. It's encouraging to see that income deprivation just before COVID had generally declined in all areas of the city. But why am I mentioning deprivation because of Exeter is a relatively wealthy city. But for some in our communities and some of our communities that is not their reality, however hard they work, and universal credit can be a really important part of the whole of their income. What is concerning is these figures show rising inequality and there are still areas of the city such as Wanford that are in the lowest 20% of deprived areas in the country. Another indicator that relates to income at levels affecting children shows that some areas such as Whipton and part of St David's Hill area have actually got worse. The city centre area of our ward of St David's, and the other two councillors here, where families with children do live but are often not very visible still ranks in the bottom 30% in the country. After the impact of COVID across the city, the removal of this universal benefit, combined with the impact of other financial pressures, is a very real blow. The Conservative government has recently announced a £500 million emergency fund, of which Devon will be awarded £5 million, a one-off measure to help people deal with the aftershocks of the pandemic. It is to be administered by local authorities. The expectation that councillors will be expected to provide small grants to meet daily needs such as food, clothing and utilities. Quite frankly, this is an insult to the poorest and most vulnerable in our community and expects councils to take on the Victorian role of deciding between the deserving and the undeserving poor to get undeserving poor to receive a grant. So I will be supporting this motion such a review is urgent and the government must act now for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrymore. I'm going to call upon my advisor, John Street, possibly uh, with the help of Councillor Ledbetter or Councillor Bialik, to try and understand 
In your question about voting separately, Andrew, does that count as an amendment to the motion? Anyone know? No, we won't accept the, the voting to unless there's a procedural reason why we have to. The motion is there and meant to be moved, and we will not seek to amend it, but of course they can amend it should they choose. Thank you, Leader. But that would, that's proposed to take them separately would need to come from the mover of the motion, Councillor Wright, to agree to take them separately to be voted upon. Yeah. If you are happy with that, then that's the way that the matter will be dealt with it when we get to the voting stage. So. Councillor Wright, are you happy with to take the two parts of the motion separately or not? Uh, yes, Lord Mayor, I would be happy to take that. Okay. Yeah, not on that point. I'm happy with that. That's a decision. I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, yeah, happy to your list. To clarify, we have the motion, and when we get to the vote, we will vote in two parts. Um, sorry for the delay, Councillor Ledbetter, in Penny dropping with me and addressing that point and clarifying it. Um, I have now, thank you for everyone else's contributions, I've got three, four people. Uh, so we will have Councillor Ruth Williams next, please, then Councillor Sutton, Councillor Wright, Councillor B. Alec, and then hopefully we'll be moving to Summing up. Oh, Councillor Wright will have to be last. Sorry, Councillor Wright. <laughs> I'll put you after Councillor B. Alec and hope no one else rises in their hand. Oh, Councillor Ward, slip you in then after Councillor B. Alec. Any more, the more the merrier. Councillor Packham. Yes, thank you, John. So we'll start with Councillor Ruth Williams, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this motion actually addresses the government levelling up agenda, doesn't it? So I would have thought that we're all um, uh, supportive of that. Just a couple of observations um, in relation to um, those people in Exeter who are really struggling um, with uh, universal credit, even though um, even with the uplift. Um, we mentioned uh, rent. In Exeter, the, if I give you some examples, which um, I did give them in the um, uh, Customer Focus Scrutiny Committee, but I think it's helpful for those that weren't at that scrutiny committee. Um, a one-bed uh, property would have a monthly allowance um, on universal credit housing allowance of £570. But the average rent in Exeter for such a property is £733. So we're getting on for £200 in excess a month. For a two-bed property, the allowance is £680, but the average rent in Exeter is £997. So that's going, that's about £300. And then if you go to a three-bed property, it's £825 a month. But the actual average rent in Exeter for such a property is 1,205, so that's over 400 pounds difference. So those families are already struggling if they're in private accommodation by a significant amount. We also have um, the Exeter Food Bank telling us that the way that people are, are trying to manage um, their um, struggling to pay the bill is that they will go to the food bank help with food and they will spend the money that they had allocated to do on paying their fuel bills, on paying their rent. And really this is completely unacceptable when we think that we are they're now going to be losing £20 a week universal credit. I think we really all should be supporting this motion and I, uh, and I thank the um, uh, Deputy Leader for bringing it. Thank you Councillor Williams. Councillor Sutton, would you speak for us, please, now? Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
I'll try not to repeat what's already been said, um, but it seems to me that, that something is very wrong um, with the systems that we have in place uh, when you actually look at the numbers that are included in this um, notice of motion. The fact that 5.8 million people are having to claim universal credit um, and nobody chooses to be in that situation. Their individual circumstances put them in that situation. And it is frankly shocking and shaming that 40% of those people are actually in work, they're in jobs. And when it says in work, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going out and, and have a well-paid office job. Many of these people will be um, holding down multiple jobs. They will be people who are cleaning early in the morning um, and then maybe going out again later in the day to do another job. Um, and the system is wrong where people who are in employment are having to ask for benefits. And Councillor Williams has talked about the, the food bank, and rightly so. And the food bank is not only providing um, food for these families, um, I was in there today, as it happens, um, they're supplying nappies, they're supplying sanitary products, they're providing soap and shampoo. Now, I have never, and I thank my lucky star, I've been in a situation where I've had to ask for help to buy food or to buy any of those other products. And these people don't want to be in that situation. And I, I was deeply shocked uh, when I read about the Minister for Work and Pensions, the Minister for Work and Pensions talking about um, the cuts to the temporary uplift in universal credit, said that all people had to do was work another couple of hours. Now, First and foremost, these people are working all hours that, that heaven sends anyway, and that is factually incorrect. And if you're not sure about that, listen to the Money Box, Radio Box Money Box program, where they dissected those figures and explained that it is not another couple of hours, depending on what employer people are in. It could be between another eight and ten hours a week to make up that difference of £20. That is the reality of the world we're living in. Um, we are a rich country. It shames us, the people in this situation. I fully support this motion, and I hope that everybody else in this room will do likewise. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sutton. Councillor Packham, could you speak for us now, please? Thank you, Laura. I just wanted to speak on the motion in its entirety. Um, to be honest, I'm just a bit taken aback that we would separate uh, the two uh, the two items. I just can't see how they're, how they're not linked. I mean, quite clearly, we've, we've seen the, the impact of the cut to universal credit. I mean, even, even before the cut, uh, the uh, children in poverty measurement and targets, a report by the House of Commons uh, Work and Pensions Committee, that uh, demonstrated the impact um, of, of coronavirus on people or families living on the brink. We know, we know that even before the pandemic, 4.3 million children and young people grow up trapped in poverty, and this is only going to make this worse. And I mean, there's a survey of any views of National Education Union members found that more than half of education staff, that's 55%, in their school or current college since the first lockdown. We see teachers providing clothes, food, children. I mean, this is every day. So we're seeing nine out of every 30 children in our classrooms in poverty. And as Councillor Morris said, in some areas, that's far higher. I just cannot, um, uh, <laughs> cannot bring myself to, um, to think that we would separate what was clearly having an impact on our communities with what we're actually going to do about it. And I think we're seeing, um, and even on universal credit, even before the cut, we're going to food banks. And I just think if you've never chosen between food or heating, food or tap banks, or food or putting you, um, uh, you know, your food or your children's food, I, mean, I just think that speaks volumes because where we can see a problem, we should be responding to it. Quite clearly, there is a significant problem, and we can't leave um, our communities vulnerable in the way that this cut is doing. Thank you, Councillor Packham.
Councillor Wright has said we will take it as two separate votes. Thank you very much for your comments, though. We will now move on to my scribbles tell me, well, hang on a minute, John, I might be disagreeing with you there. No, we've got Councillor Bialik, then Councillor Wood, then Councillor Atkinson, and then I think Councillor Wright will be able to sum up, hopefully. So you are right, John, it's Councillor Bialik. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Again, I have no wish to repeat what is said uh, by the members on this side, but are totally supportive. And one way I want to look, ask you to look at this is number one, £87 a month. That's a week's shop, or not even a week's shop. This will mean some people will not be able to do their shopping that week in order to make sure they pay other bills if they can afford uh, to do that. And I think it is appalling what's going on, particularly what's going on in relation to the rise of national insurance and 43% of these will all be paid extra, extra for, to provide services for the older generations. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it at all, but once again, it is the working people who are being asked to pay. And I'm not referring to the last motion, but actually that would help tremendously if we can get that going. So 87 pounds is a weekly shop, and you need to wait for this. I agree with Councillor Diana Moore, and what she said. There you are, Diana. That five million, do you know what they're trying to do? They always say, well, we've given you five million pounds, or we've 55 million pounds. Well, that's the job done, is it? What they are actually reinstitution, reintroducing effectively is the parish. Now, poor people, a good century ago, were dependent upon the parish. You had to present yourself, you know, the undeserving poor. You went to the parish. And that is effectively what we're asking. I can imagine there's a lot of people we are actually hitting the dignity of these people in having to make these claims like this when it should be provided for. That's what incenses me. We'll take the money, we'll deal with the money, and this council will disperse the money. But once again, it feels like we are operating the parish system. For anybody who wants to look that up online, what used to happen, the undeserving poor, and I think it's shameful. I'll be supporting both of these recommendations in this motion, Lord Mayor. Councillor thank you for that. I will now ask Councillor Wood to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> I think that the, the thing that I really feel that, that needs to be highlighted most is that this is a subsistence benefit. This is not a top up, it's not enough. This is, this is designed effectively to prop up the underpayment of working people. If you were working, if, you, if a proper rate was paid, those at work would not need to claim a benefit. A proper rate is not paid, so the state props up the underpayment of working people. But not just that, now, with rising fuel and rising food prices, the state now wants to cut that back. So how is that, that an incentive to work? I don't understand that. What I do know is a subsistence benefit should be enough to live on. And clearly, if we take the money off, then it isn't enough. And with regard to the second item, with ongoing inflated costs of food and fuel, that is the core, and rent, that is the core elements that all, just about all of this universal uh, benefit would be spent on. So, of course, you should link the two together. If food or fuel or rent, probably all three, shoot up, then clearly universal benefit would not be enough. So why would it not be linked to those three key elements of what needs to be paid to live? It's a subsistence benefit and it should be enough to, to uh, live on. And uh, I think that the, that level of cut is going to drive people into uh, debt. Um, and if we don't reflect the costs are, are rocketing, if we don't reflect the impact um, that we're having on the supply chain and the prices that result from that, 
I, it's just, it be, it's beyond belief, to be honest. Um, and I think that this is the least that we can do, is to show support for this. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Councillor Atkinson, next. Thank you. Um, being a civilised society means that we must accept responsibility for people who, have, by reason of birth or bad luck, don't have the same chances um, as a lot of, uh, a lot of us um, have. And, and as many of the pre, uh, predecessors have said, you know, this is a subsistence payment and it's a question of morality here as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I'm a socialist, I believe in making sure that people who don't have the chances that I have get it by support from a stable, wise government who puts the policies in place to support them. And I've had to be supported in my life by that fantastic state that we have. And what we have now is a situation with this universal credit, which was set at too low of a rate already, and was put up. And you've heard from um, Councillor um, Sutton that this idea that they're just taking away two hours' work is rubbish. I mean, all the evidence is that most people on universal, well, not 38% of people on universal credit are in working families who rely on this because they don't, can't do the hours to support their family above the poverty level. So that those kind of her people, a single woman having, looking after children at home, she has to work nine extra hours to get that 20 pounds back and pay childcare on top of that if she can get it. How does that make sense to level up and support working people? They're never going to get out of that trap that this is about to happen. Um, and the Bank of England says the rate of interest is expected to be 4%. Well, on top of that cut, they've got to pay 4%. And that's a known fact. So we are pushing those people in poverty. And what have they put in place? They put in place this local government support grant, which means people have to come as Council Violet and say, is, I'm sorry, I'm disabled, I'm poor, I can't work, I've got kids, please help me out. And we have to say we've been given, I think we've been given in debt than five million pounds. I think that's great, isn't it? In debt five million pounds. And I think that probably means a few lucky people might get their needs met overall to drop in the ocean. For meeting the, I don't know what the figures are, but it's, I, I think it was said at the County Council meeting the other day, it is a drop in the ocean and doesn't any go anywhere near replacing what's been taken away in this um, 20 pound. Sorry, it's immoral this to do this. And I am so pleased that, at least in the first case, that our members on the other side support the fact, as indeed five sec former Secretary of State of the Concerted Party, that it is wrong to take away this 20. And I'm grateful to Councillor Ledbetter for doing that. Uh, and uh, please vote for this motion. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. I'm now calling upon Councillor Wright to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I won't say too much because um, we've had some really, really good um, words from everybody else who's, who's been very eloquent about this and raised many good points. And I think I would be surprised at this point if anybody were to vote against this motion. Just very quickly, though. I know what it's like to have to make that choice between food or fuel. When my uh, children were younger, I was a single parent and was on income support for a period um, of time before I then went to university, um, even though the grant that I got was half the amount I was getting on income support. I was very lucky to be able to uh, bust my way through my, my degree. But at the point of being on um, benefits, you have to remember, those benefits are there to just about bring you over the red line every week. When your children ask to go to parties at the weekend of a school friends and you can't afford to buy the present for them to take so they can't go, it's heartbreaking. My children recently, who are now um, in their 30s and their 20s, told me that I was such a fun mum. They remember having really lovely meals at home that sometimes we would have meals by candlelight and I would call it the, the French experience. We'd have the meal by candlelight and that was wonderful. Other times we would have a cowboy meal and I would do burritos, etc. What they didn't realise was the meals by candlelight were at the time when I couldn't actually 
put anything on the key meter. So what, what, what we had <laughs> then, um, I didn't use electricity for, but I was able to use the gas cooker. So I was able to cook a meal that we had by candlelight. They thought that was fantastic, but it's not that fantastic if you're trying to actually do that. Uh, the other meals, sometimes I put, put money on the electric, but not the gas. So the burritos were made in the microwave, and we had cowboy nights. But we then used to dress up in blankets and pretend we were sitting around a campfire because I couldn't actually put the heating on. So that was quite a few years ago. That's no different now. People are already making those choices. And now fuel bills going up, it's just going to make it worse. Just money was given. The rise to uplift, yes, as a temporary measure. But since that money was given, food has gone up considerably. Fuel has gone up, rent has gone up, as we've heard from everybody. To take that £20 back uh, now is, is almost criminal. Um, I take, uh, come to the left at this point, about the two uh, points here, point one and two. If I'd been a bit more savvy, I would have put the two together so that they would have read awarded uh, in the first tranche of the COVID-19 pandemic and to raise the payment levels in line. I wonder if I had done that if Councillor Leffetter and, and his group would have voted for a full point at number one. Having agreed to split the two points, I do now actually ask you if you would consider voting for both because I would like to be able to send this motion up with the support, full support of full council on both points one and two. If there were to be a review, an urgent review, I think it would be highly um, unlikely, surely, that the government would do a review and then say, oh yes, well, we don't need to put the, the money up. So perhaps I shouldn't have bothered with number two. But I would ask, please, Councillor Ledbetter and Tid's group to consider voting for both points. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, members. Thank you, Councillor Wright, and thank you all members. I now move to the vote on the first part of the notice of motion. Number one. Can all in favour of the motion please show now? Hands up nice and high, please. I think that is unanimously carried. Thank you, members. I'm now going to call the vote on part two of the motion. Can all those in favour raise their hands now? Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you, members. The notice of motion, part one is unanimously one, and part two is one. This has been a distressing motion and conversation, and therefore I'm calling a comfort break. We will return in five minutes.
item 19 on the agenda, which relates to questions from members in accordance with Standing Order 8. I can confirm that questions have been received from Councillors Holland and Diana Moore. Our members, you have been emailed a copy of those questions separately. Can I please remind all councillors that the questions and answers will be given without debate. Those questioners who are present are entitled to a supplementary question. Again, it should be put and answered without debate. I'm very grateful to Councillor Holland, who is representing me at the Lord Lieutenant's Cadet Awards this evening. No doubt enjoying delicious grub at Lockbeer House. So I'm going to ask John Street to set up the question from Councillor Holland. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The question is, could the leader portfolio holder outline the procedure followed by Exeter City Council when notifying Devon County Council where permission has been granted for a change of use from a domestic dwelling to a house of multiple occupancy? Also, how many such notifications have been made to the County Council during the last 15 months? Councillor Bialik, would you reply? Councillor Morse will have portfolio holder check. Oh, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The City Council does not currently have a procedure for notifying Devon County Council where permission has been granted for a change of use from a domestic dwelling to a house of multiple occupancy. There is no obligation to do this, and Devon County Council has not requested the information. All planning decisions are published online and are available for public viewing. So, no supplementary, no supplementary as Councillor Holland isn't here, probably on this by now with any luck. Um, the next question is from Diana Moore. Diana Councillor, Diana Moore, please could you ask your question? Thank you. A prospectus for a development fund in Exeter was recently published. This shows the structure of an asset-backed investment fund with the City Council, NHS Trust, County Council and University all being the first entrants into this fund putting in assets as an equity stake. Please can the portfolio holder explain which type of council asset has been used for the modelling that underpins this prospectus? Would you like to respond to that, Councillor Bialik? Uh, uh, a prospectus has not been published for a development fund in Exeter. I assume Councillor Moore is referring to an expression of interest that went to MHCLG, which is available on the Exodus City Futures website. This was part of the bid process to secure funding to develop a business case for an alternative way of funding the delivery program for Liverpool Exeter. The documentation does not imply commitment from any of the parties, including um, mentioning including the City Council. As part of the strategic case, Exeter City Futures is exploring optimal structures for a fund to establish its value in use to the city with no specific assets yet earmarked for detailed modelling. Any supplementary questions from Councillor Bialik? Yes, please, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you for clarifying that you don't consider it a prospectus. Um, Exeter City Futures, when I wrote to them about it, did call it that, so there's obviously some confusion. Um, as the project is moving into a second stage, at what stage does the portfolio holder intend to present this project to Council, and what scrutiny will he expect of it? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Diana Moore. To be quite honest, there's a number of imaginative ways that we have to seek funding in order to get Liverpool Exeter uh, through and indeed to fund things within the city. We are not yet at any stage of bringing any proposals together. When they are, I shall be taking them to the executive and there will be an opportunity for either that to be called in. However, it could well be a big thing and I will consider whether or not, indeed, it's a matter for uh, the, uh, the Scrutiny Programme Board, and I would never, ever try to influence 
the chair of the Programme Scrutiny Board on what they will bring forward, to be honest. If they want to bring it forward and we've got a plan, as long as we can get on with that plan, I don't mind uh, listening to what scrutiny would have to say. But we're nowhere near it yet. It's not there, I can assure you. Thank you, Councillor Bialik, and thank you, members. We have reached the end of the agenda, but we now need to return to the minutes of the Executive Committee held on 5th of October to discuss the Part 2 items. We will need to move the meeting into Part 2. Is someone prepared to move? Thank you. Is there a seconder? A second order. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So, we'll just give a minute for the live stream. Oh, sorry, can we all vote? All in favour? Yeah, unanimous. Just 